So hello, welcome back to Chasing the Dream. I'm your host, Ethan Chasen. I'm a New York-based organization development coach, and I am, oh man, I am beyond thrilled to share with you today's host, Alexander Karouf. Alexander is the founder and chief happiness officer of WooHoo, and he's also one of the world's leading experts on happiness at work. And he's here to join us today on this little podcast. And Alexander is the author and speaker who's presented and conducted workshops on happiness at work, at business and conferences in 50 plus countries. And his mm-hmm. roster of notable clients include, it's pretty much a who's who of great work workplace cultures, companies like Hilton, Microsoft, Ikea, Shell, HP, and IBM. And so as far as Alexander, he's got a master's degree in computer science from the University of Southern Denmark. He was a co-founder of the Danish IT company, Enterprise Systems. He's the author of five books, including the international bestseller, check this out, Happy Hour is nine to five. (laughs) How to love your job, love your life, and kick butt at work. And I can't wait till we talk about that. The book's available, actually. It's globally embraced. It's available in 11 languages. And he's also, his latest book is Leading with Happiness. How the mm-hmm. best leaders put happiness first to create phenomenal business results and a better world. His work's been featured on CNN, the New York Times, the Times of India, the Times, BBC, the Financial Times, and many others. And so without further ado, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen, welcome to the program, Alexander. My absolute pleasure. I'm so glad we're doing this. Uh, also, hey. can I just say, uh, uh, Chasen, Chasen the Dream, best, best name ever, best name ever. <laughs> and you've heard it here first from an international celebrity on workplace culture and empowering employees. Um, thank you. But uh, right out of the gate, I have to ask you, young man, um, where is this lifelong fascination for and passion with employees who are happy and motivated and mm-hmm. unleashing their untapped potential as a result? Where, where did it come from? Oh, I, for me, it started with myself. So uh, I remember back when I was a teenager, I was I was uh, you know uh, finishing high school, uh, high school, and I was looking at what to study. Uh, I wanted to go to university. I knew that, right? But what did I want to study? And my main goal was I want to study something that that was fun, something that was exciting, something that I would enjoy working with, right? So of course, I went into uh, computer science because uh, I was a I was a major nerd at the time. Fun and exciting. Uh, Exactly, exactly. So uh, so I worked in the IT industry uh, as a consultant for a number of years, uh, and that was not necessarily a happy time. Uh, I remember one consulting company I worked for, the, the entire job interview was, uh, how many hours do you think you can build a week as a consultant? That was all they wanted to know. Yeah, sounds pretty That's standard. The, the, the only interesting, yeah. Uh, so when I got the chance to, uh, to create my own uh, tech company, uh, I, I co-founded a tech company, Copenhagen, with two other guys in 1997. Holy shit, that's a long time ago. Um, we were like, let's make this a good workplace. Uh, let's make this a, a place where people actually like to work. And it was. And we ran the company for five years. Uh, didn't have a single person quit ever. Um, in five we years? Sold in five years, yeah. And then we, wow. in, t- in tech, where people notoriously uh, change jobs at the drop of a right. hat, right? right. Um, and then we, then we sold the company in 2002. And I sort of asked myself, okay, so now what I want to do? Do I want to, uh, do I want to start a new tech company? And then that's when the idea struck me that you know this this whole happiness idea thing, it's it's so important. Somebody should do something about it. Um, as as uh, as Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead once said, uh, somebody has to do something, and it's just incredibly pathetic that it has to be us. Um, yeah. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this. I I started a uh, Woo Inc in 2002. Uh, sorry, 2003, and I've been doing that ever since. Uh, yeah. yeah it, it, okay. Fun and exciting computer programming, computer science. We'll leave that open for debate. But <laughs> <laughs> the, the question about you and your two co-founders starting enterprise systems and saying we want to create a fun place to work I means zero turnover in a highly kind of you know ter- high turnover rate industry is IT. Zero turnovers. Yeah. How did you build that? What What was the focus? How did you create a workplace where people wanted to be and wanted to be their best selves? Yeah. 
Uh, I mean, we had we had long conversations before we started the company, so we were very intentional about this before we actually, you know, signed the papers and and started the company. We talked for for months about this. So here are some of the things we did. So for instance, normal working hours, right? And, uh, IT is uh, is uh, notorious for people working 50, 60, 70 hours a week, insane deadlines. We did not do any of that. Uh, so normal work hours, plenty of vacation time. We had a huge focus on like the technical competency on building that for people. So for instance. We had uh, an annual training budget for each employee that you were obliged to spend. You had to spend it. So, so I'm sorry. I know that you're still going through this, but I've got to beg you to say that again because I think that that's so critically important. Yeah. What was your philosophy? What was your framework around employee training? Oh, we just we just think that if people are happy at work if they're constantly developing their uh, developing their skills, especially in tech, where people are. You know, uh, nerds are like very, um, they're proud of their skills, right? They want to be good at what they do. They want to deliver the best possible solutions for the clients. Um, so so we wanted to constantly develop. So we had uh, in, in 40,000 Danish kroner is about 6,000 US dollars uh, tra annual training budget that you must spend. Uh, you are obliged to spend it. Uh, you also for the to entire take... workforce or for each? No, for, for per, per person. Six thousand dollars U.S. Per, per person. person, yeah, per year that you had to spend, and 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 a two hours like uh, oh, sorry, wow. a two week uh, time frame. So you had to take two weeks off for trainings or conferences or whatever. Um, we had uh, we had uh, you had to yeah uh, in Denmark we have five or six weeks of vacation a year, and uh, we decided on six, and you m were obliged to take your vacation weeks every single year. Uh, you couldn't skip. Um, we gave people a lot of freedom as to what they wanted to work on. So um, so you were never put on a project. You could say, you know, this project looks interesting. I want to work on that. So people had a lot of... How, um, how, how do you, um, from a practical, from a logistical perspective, how do you implement that? Because I'm just hearing the voice as you are in your head, every American CEO saying, that is impossible. <laughs> there is no way to do that. Logistically, that would be a nightmare. We would never undertake that. How did you do that? Yeah. Oh, I mean, there are, there, it's, this is not actually that hard. You just, you know, here are the, here's the stuff we need to do. Who wants to do what? Instead of saying, you, Ethan, you're going to work on that project. No, I don't care if that's not your style or your competencies. It's just like, give people choice, give people freedom. Um, in fact, we, uh, we didn't have bosses at the company. Uh, we ran the organization democratically, made all the big decisions together. Uh, for I, instance, I have to I, again I have to stop you. <laughs> I can I can I tell to, I'm blowing your I, mind a little bit here. I, you <laughs> saw me kind of ruminate, and I just said, "Stop! This is the antithesis or contrary to so much of the, what the conventional 20th century mindset is around yes. organizational structure, which is control." Um, what the hell do you mean, no bosses? Well, uh, we made all the big decisions democratically. We had like uh, every two weeks we had a meeting where we like, what do we need to decide on? I'll give you a specific example. Um, in 2001, we had like the big uh, IT tech crash, the whole industry crashed, right? And suddenly we, we were losing about, I think about half our revenue was just gone because uh, customers kept canceling projects. So we're like, now what do we- post Y2K. Uh, post Y2K, it was the, the whole dot-com crash. Happened okay. around then, yeah. Okay. Um, so we were like, okay, how do we want to handle this? And of course, many organizations would have had uh, layoffs, and we considered that. And and then in the end, we decided not to. We made a democratic decision to say what we're going to do instead is that we're all going to take pay cuts, um, and that'll mean that we uh, we all took a twenty five percent pay cut, and that will mean that we wouldn't have to lay off a single person. And then, of course, what happened was that six months later, the market recovered. Everybody was back and working on projects, and we could actually. We could actually pay back everybody, uh, pay everybody back for the uh, the 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 reduced salary. So it ended up uh, over the year you got your original salary anyway. We uh, decided on things like bonuses uh, democratically. It's I'm not saying that's the way to run every company, uh, but it was it worked for us, and I could take a lot of those experiences with me, um, and in 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 um, in advising the clients that I've been working with uh, in in Wink. So, I, I also can I can also just say this, yeah. all this all of this sounds super weird. This again, this is not for every organization, but there are actually many many workplaces in the world who operate like this without bosses. Um, 
uh, it, this is not this is not a new idea. Um, one of my favorite examples is a company in Spain uh, called Mondragon. They have eighty thousand employees, and they have been operating like this since the nineteen fifties. So mm -hmm. none of this is radical. None of this is weird. All of this has been proven to work and actually work better. Um, there's a company in the U.S. called Morningstar Tomatoes. Have you heard of them? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and they have been operating without bosses uh, since the company was started in, I believe, in the 90s. Uh, so this is not weird. This totally works. It actually well, works way better. That's that's what you say, is it's not yeah. weird. And what I mean by that is I've spent 15 years attempting to articulate the vision of self-managed teams and world-class yeah. organizations. I've told people who care enough to go look at Ethisphere and kind of research this. But you're right. It may not be suitable for everybody because most organizations are nowhere near of the mindset where they're willing to embrace this kind of radical employee yeah. autonomy. Yeah. And I guess um, my my question is, as you kind of proselytize and you go out, you've written five books, in your latest book, Putting Happiness First um, to Create Phenomenal Business Results, what how, how do you how do you quantify the, yeah. the bridge between giving you know self-managed teams giving people control letting them choose what they work on and those organizations who go down that road outperforming their competitors how, how do you draw the straight through line of logic on that i mean you can uh, you you go to the science that's what you got to do there is science and research and studies on this that very clearly shows that when or when employees are happy they do a better job and they and, and, and there are so many business benefits to having happy employees and so many costs to having unhappy employees because we well, know that when employees can are miserable. Can you talk a little bit about that from your yeah. experience, both running yeah. your own business and just the research you've conducted? Yeah. Uh, so we know from studies that if employees are unhappy, they have higher uh, turnover rates. I mean, that's this is not like, exactly weird, right? If people don't like right. their jobs, they quit more often. Especially uh, Gen Zs. Especially then, and, and, and good on them, good on them. Right. Um, we have higher absenteeism if people are not happy at work because people get sick. And we know this when people are stressed and burn, uh, when people are stressed, they burn out more, they get sick. Um, we have, when people are happy at work, we have higher productivity. There is so much research on this that show that, that shows that people do a better job when they actually like what they do. Again, not, not exactly surprising, right? Uh, something like creativity and innovation. People's minds are more open to new ideas and they are more willing to take a risk if they're happy at work. Um, so you get more creativity and innovation in the workplace. Um, something like, uh, oh, so I think this is interesting, um, workplace accidents. There's some very interesting research, like if you work in production, if you work in construction, that kind of thing, that if people are happy at work, you get fewer workplace accidents, and then you get fewer sick days uh, from workplace accidents. Uh, so in, in, in just uh, basically, you know, when people are happy at work, work so much, so many things just go smoother, right? Mm -hmm. When people are miserable, everybody's fighting each other. Everybody's playing the politics. Everybody's like out to get each other. Um, everybody's just trying to maximize their own slice of the cake. Uh, everybody's just in it for themselves in unhappy workplaces. But in a happy workplace, people actually like each other. They want each other to succeed. They support each other. You get better teamwork. You get better communication, better coordination. Um, so there's like endless, endless business benefits to to uh, to having happy employees. So oh, all of this amazing upside, all of this benefit, um, all of this positive, which leads to performance, productivity, as you said, profitability. I have a question for you. So yeah, when I asked you about starting your own business, you said before we even launched the business, you're two, you're two co-founders and you talked about being intentional about how to yeah. create it at the beginning. How would you advise somebody who's already gone down the road? They've got, if not a few hundred, a few thousand employees, their their culture they've identified as being a barrier for them yeah. moving forward. How would you advise them to say, hold on, this is how we might go through culture transformation and implementing a more happy workplace for employees so that they can get the benefits that you've talked about? Yes, and, that, and here's the good news. It can be done. I mean, of course it's easier uh, if you build it into the company from the very beginning, like we did in our tech company, right, right. Uh, but you don't have to. And there are there are examples of like 
huge companies with thousands of employees changing from being toxic to being very positive organizations where people actually love to work. Um, there are great examples of that. Um, so here's what you need to do. First of all, you need to figure out why you want to do it. Uh, because that why is going to going to sustain you over the long run. It can't just be like a, uh, like an idea you get. Oh yeah, let's let's do something to make our employees happy, and then you forget right. all about it later. Right. Um. So so figure out why. What exactly? Why exactly is this going to help your business? And that's going to be different from company to company, from industry to industry. You know, maybe if you work in retail, maybe uh, you know that happy employees create happy customers, and happy customers come back to the store, and you sell more. Right. right. Maybe right. you work in healthcare and you know that happy employees deliver better healthcare so you get better patient outcomes. But identify why does your organization need this? What is what's it gonna do for your company? I think that's a that's where you need to start. Um and there's a ton of research on this. We get and and uh, if anybody's interested, send me an email, I'll be happy to point you to it. Um and then secondly, it's you gotta figure out what makes employees happy. And this is where a lot of companies get it wrong. Because that's well, where they tell start. Us how, tell us how to get it right. Because I agree, that, most yeah. organizations don't do this very well. Exactly. So, uh, there again, there's a ton of research on what makes people happy at work. And there are many great models. Our model is that people are happy at work when they have, we call it results and relationships. So, results is I do is, is this feeling that I do a good job. I'm good at my job. Um, I can fulfill my goals. I can, uh, you know, develop and grow and learn new skills. Um, I can take pride in the work I do, and very important, my work is meaningful. It's not just a number of tasks that I can check off my to-do list. Me meaningful to whom? Yep, uh, that's the thing. If if I can see that my it needs to be meaningful to me, to me, right? okay, it's, yeah, it's not enough that it's meaningful to the boss, right? Maybe the boss can see that my work helps increase his chance of getting a bonus, right? That's not going to be super meaningful to me. It's I have to have that feeling that. My work matters to somebody, um, and I and and I have that feeling. We have that feeling when we can see our work helping somebody else, when we can see the actual outcome of the work that we do. For instance, when I was in tech, and I could see that you know uh, we developed a solution for a client, and the users loved it, and it made their work days better and easier. That made my that made my day a little better. Again, if you are a nurse and you can see that the patients in your care get better, again that's that's super meaningful because now your work is helping somebody else. Uh, it could also be that your work is helping coworkers, right? Maybe you're you're in internal support in your organization. You can see that your work makes your coworkers' work days a little easier. That's, but you need that's this an feeling. interesting observation, Alexander, because I feel like that piece is most often overlooked. Uh, completely, when you're talking to organizations about the benefit of this. It's they, they don't really consider the peer relationship aspect in terms of, as you said, you know, getting rid of bosses means they're going to work collaboratively. Like, in fact, yeah, actually, and in, in fact, I think organizations are very bad at, at giving employees this feeling that they, they get results, this feeling that they're good at their jobs. Very often what we tell employees, you know, if, if, if Johnson over here has completed 90% of their tasks, what do we tell them? Hey, what about the last 10%? When are you going to get on those, right? Um, and so, so we, we're constantly telling people what they haven't done, and we're rarely celebrating what they have completed. That's part of it. And then part of it is also we rarely focus on the meaningful outcomes of the work they do. So very can often you, it's Can you goals. give a little bit of um, clarity around what that actually means? Yeah, yeah. So my, so for instance, let's say, uh, I'll give you a specific example. I would say one of our clients uh, is a uh, pharmaceutical uh, production company in Denmark uh, called Koloplast. They make the various uh, medical uh, devices, right? And of course, everybody in production has production goals. They have actual factory lines mm. making a lot of this stuff, right? And they have goals. You know, you need to produce a certain number of thing thingies every week. For instance, one thing they make is uh, catheters and urine bags for people who have lost control over their bladder. So, for instance, people in wheelchairs, paraplegics, that kind of thing. Um, so they had a problem with quality. Uh, people, so that each team was reaching their production goals, but the quality wasn't good enough. So what they did that was I thought that was brilliant was they brought in two people who were in wheelchairs. Uh, and had them talk about uh, talk, give a talk to the employees over lunch to talk about you know what's it like to be in a wheelchair, what's it like to use these products, what ha what happens when this product fails, and suddenly you're in your wheelchair and you're soaked in urine because this this bag or the catheter failed or the joint failed or whatever, and now suddenly you're not as as an employee on this factory line, you're not just 
you know, putting this cardboard thing into right, this plastic right, thing. Right. Now you're actually helping some people who desperately need your product. And what happened after that was that that production rate stayed the same, but quality shot up. Um, so that's that's a specific example of showing employees that we're not just you know checking off production targets. We are making a positive difference in some people's lives when we do our jobs well. And that gives us this feeling of meaningful results. Um, and then the other aspect of what makes us happy is relationships. Um, and that's basically comes down to liking the people we work with. So when I go wait, to work... Wait, I'm sorry. You pay... <laughs> I'm sorry. You pay me this thing called indentured servitude. It's called the paycheck. Now you expect me to actually like the people I work with? I know, right? It's a weird concept. Wait, what a novel concept. I know, I know. But the idea here is that please, we... Please, enlighten. Yeah. yeah. So the idea is that we create workplaces where we're actually nice to each other. Um, and there is a ton of research that shows how important this is and, and what happens to us, you know, how good it is for us to have good relationships in the workplace and how damaging it is to have bad relationships in the workplace. Uh, when we have things like infighting, uh, gossiping, bullying even... Uh, bullying can be incredibly damaging. It yeah. can completely ruin people, ruin people's uh, mental well-being, uh, create a lot of psychological problems. So, good workplace relationships. You know, when we actually like each other in our teams, uh, when there's a good relationship between the manager and the employees, um, that has a hugely positive effect on our happiness at work, and we feel way better. So, I, so I actually have a um, a deeper dive question on that. So. One might actually ask you, Alexander, how might I create a culture, a workplace environment, which people really like working with each other if they are not responsible for or able to hire the people that join their team? So it sounds yeah. almost like you're saying it's good to have it, but it's hit or miss whether you'll get that. Well yeah, well, uh, one thing I've noticed is that when you go to the really good workplaces, they are very intentional about who they hire, and they are very intentional about, uh, intentional about culture fit. So making sure that the people we hire will fit into the team we already have uh, and not just hire based on skill. Uh, I think a great example is Southwest Airlines who say, we hire for attitude and we train for skill. Um, another good example is Zappos. Um, in in Vegas, who hire for cult for uh, sorry for values fit, they have ten corporate values, and you need to uh, fit with those values. Um, so yeah, and of course another option is to let employees themselves, let the team, be involved in who we hire for that team. Uh, that that uh, that can solve a lot of these problems. But yes, I, I mean hiring is is huge. I mean if you if you hire just one jerk. Uh, that person can ruin an entire team, and especially if the, if you hire jerks as managers, and many companies do, uh, that can have a tremendously bad effect. One of my favorite business book ever business books ever is the the No Asshole Rule by Bob Sutton, a Stanford professor, who talks about the 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 how just how damaging they are, especially in uh in in management positions. I I, I hear through. Our entire talk today and everything I've ever kind of researched about you, you talk consistently. There's a, a, a central thread of DNA around your your framework, your your ideology, and it's mm -hmm. empowering employees, giving them yes. autonomy, freeing up control. What you young men are proposing is very dangerous. It's the notion <laughs> of it's the notion of an employee centric model for culture which fits the 21st century. Um, yeah. And any kind of last thoughts, like if somebody were sitting with you and said, give me the advice and counsel of what would you say are the top priorities for creating great culture and achieving happy employees? I think the, the, uh, my main message that it all boils down to is that happiness at work is something we do. I mean, you can't do this with slogans. You can't do it with values. You can't do it with, you know, internal processes or like HR, uh, like a, a, the employee handbook, right? Uh, it's something we do. It's 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 how do we how do we work together? How do we treat each other on a daily basis? That's what it comes down to. And as an organization, you can do a lot of things to foster results and relationships, right? You can do you can you can set put structures in place for, for instance, how you hire and train managers how you hire and train employees, 
how you do, how we work together, the systems we have, the processes we have to make sure that uh, people experience results relationships pretty much every single day, that they can go home from work pretty much every single day and say, you know what, today I did great work together with great people. Um, and if you can do that, um, that that is going to make people happy. And here's the cool thing. None of this, this is terribly complicated. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's right. not exactly rocket. It's not exactly rocket science. This is about on many levels, it's about treating people as, as adult, responsible human beings. I mean, a, 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 a pet peeve of mine is uh, dress codes. I mean, how much have you failed in your hiring processes if you have to tell your employees how to dress themselves Thank in you. the morning? Thank you. Um, so why not why not just say, you know what, you're all responsible human beings. Uh, you you best know, you know, what a kind of attire will fit into your tasks today. Maybe you have some client meetings and you want to be in a suit. Maybe you don't, or and you want to be in a Hawaii shirt, right? Or maybe you have a client who actually is cool and chill and relaxed, and you know that client will appreciate a Hawaii shirt. Um it, it this is that's just one example, but the more, you know, if what if we what if we treat our employees like adult responsible human beings? Uh, people tend to live up or down to the expectations you set of them. Um, so yeah, that's there's a lot in that. It, it is basically, it is I, at the core of this. It's something we do because we care about our people. Uh, I, um, we actually, yeah. I yeah no. This is this is so meaningful on so many levels to me. And you you're really as we wrap up, you're creating the need for you to come back. But you're creating like a thousand questions that I have for every kind of nugget of information. And I guess my question, the most immediate pressing question I have for you, and then I want to ask kind of like, what's the future, the next few mm -hmm. years for Alexander? But uh, I have a question based on everything you said today. If you understand and if you dedicated your career to happy employees who are more able to contribute to the organization, how come so many business owners senior executives, they've got three levers they can pull, right? The strategy lever, the operations, and then the people. How come so few organizations are really focused on pulling the people lever? Well, what is that? Why is that? <laughs> Why are it's you laughing the, at me? It's the, it's, no, I, it's a great question. And I'm laughing because it's a, it's a, it's a serious issue and you got to laugh, right? Yes. Um, it's uh, it's it's the easy thing, right? If if so, if there are systemic problems in an organization, like employees are unhappy, they're stressed, they're burning out. If we can fix the employees, that will be so much easier, right? If we have to fix strategy and processes, an organization, and that would mean we have to look inwards, we have to look in the mirror and say, hey, maybe I'm the problem. Maybe I need to change my ways. Maybe maybe the way I've been looking at things is all wrong. And I will say this in, in the defense of many of these people is that they have been trained on the other stuff, right? Okay. If you take an MBA, you are not going to learn a lot about being a good leader. You're not going to learn a lot about being uh, humane and kind and caring to employees. You're going to learn a lot about profit margins and strategy and that kind of thing, right? Um, I, I took a strategy course myself online because I, I, should, I should learn some business. I have, I have no business formal training in business. I was like, I should learn something. And I was so depressed because it was so much focused, entirely focused on creating strategic business profit advantage. Yeah, uh, it sucked. So, well, so yeah. So that I think it's it's um, uh, what is it, Michael Jackson? I'm starting with the man in the mirror. Uh, I think that's that's hard. That's a tricky thing to do, and they don't like it. If we could just fix the people, that would be so much easier. Right. And that's kind of, you read my mind, that's kind of where I was going with why organizations are so remiss to focus on the people is because then they have to face the hard truths and ask the hard questions. So yeah. uh, I appreciate that greatly. So I guess as we kind of wrap up, I want to make sure I get a chance to ask you um, the other bit about where where are you going to be focusing on next? Obviously, you have this fifth book coming out, but where do you kind of, where are you looking towards in the future of happy employees, a workplace culture, and what do you focus on? What what do you want to have happen as a result of the next yeah. stage of your group? I I want to yeah, a great question. I want to. So first of all, I'm incredibly optimistic. Um, I, I because I think I I I've seen workplaces get better, and I know this is hard to believe because it's very easy to focus on all the toxic workplaces and the bad bosses out there, and they definitely exist. 
But we can we can all ask ourselves this: Would we rather work in a typical workplace as they exist today, or a typical workplace of fifty years ago, or a hundred years ago? And I I would much rather much rather work in a typical workplace today. Things were bad fifty years ago, like uh like the way you know like sexism in the workplace were perfectly normal. You know all the bosses were men, all the women were secretaries, uh, or the secretaries were women, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, the things it, it's hard to see. Uh, because the bad examples take up so much oxygen, but so. things are getting better in the workplace, and they're getting better for many reasons. Uh, partly because more and more people are waking up to this, and partly because young people uh, in the workplace today take very little crap um, and and will quit, uh, are more willing to quit than previous generations, uh, which I think is amazing. Um, so more and more organizations are kind of uh, forced to do something about this or they will lose all of their best and most talented employees to the competition. So I, I, I have, I, there is in, 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 I've been doing this for over 20 years now, and there's more attention on happiness work now than there has ever been in the history of mankind, which is fantastic. Um, so, so the main job I think we have now is to keep that going, to highlight all the good examples, and then to help focus the organizations that are willing to take up this challenge. Help them fo- help them focus in the right direction, uh, instead of wasting time and money on the wrong things that are not going to work. Uh, let's say say well, here are some things that are actually super easy, super cheap, fast to do, um, and that will pro- that, and that will actually work in your workplace. Try those instead. Um, show them some good examples and help them to do that. That is my that is my uh, philosophy. That's what I try to do. So Alexander, and first of all, I, I just. I don't want to let this opportunity pass just to tell you how much I appreciate you coming on and sharing your thoughts. And I guess my last question is, if somebody were to say to you, were to say to me, how can I get in touch with Alexander and talk about those relatively easy things to implement? How can I pick his brain for how to go from barely good enough to great culture? How would they reach you? Um, I share uh, most of my stuff on LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, I'm uh, my my LinkedIn handle is the Chief Happiness Officer, or just Google my name, uh, search by my name on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm always happy to connect. Please do that. Um, I have a YouTube channel called Woo Wink. Uh, mm-hmm. I share my thoughts on there as well. Um, and I also have a blog called PositiveSharing.com, where I share a lot of articles. Uh, there's like thousands of articles on there now. And of course, uh, if anybody is interested in booking me to come speak at their company, uh, Woo uh, and I will, like just it. to let you know, I will, for everybody listening in, I will put all of the links that Alexander just mentioned below. So Sweet. Um, thank you again, Alexander, for coming on Chasing the Tree. It's been no, thank, my- thank you for making this happen. Thank you for making this happen. It's been amazing. Well, th- what you share is critically important that organizations, as you said, are starting to think about it and embrace it. And to the extent that they can continue to transform – This is going to create an amazing opportunity for people to either start their careers or grow through their career. So thank you for sharing your your, your ideas and, and your philosophies. My absolute pleasure.